Welcome everyone, another week here with Dr. McDougall, live with Dr. McDougall. I'm Gustavo Tolosa, I'm hosting this webinar as I do every Thursday and I'm very happy to see all of you logging in. Thank you for logging in. And um, today we have uh, Dr. McDougall and he will talk to us about a couple of events coming up and then we will he will focus on chapter 13 of his digestive tune-up book about exploring the F word. <laughs> I love wow. that subtitle. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, How are you doing, Dr. McDougall? Good, good. We just, uh, I, I think I talked about it while we were running it last week, <clears throat> the 53-person yeah. uh, 10-day program. We just, you know, people, people cannot believe how well run the program is and how much it's dedicated to changing their mind and every aspect is practical. And like for now, uh, for example, now on the discussion board on the website <coughs> is a, a testimony from a lady who was in the program five months earlier and she gained three pounds in that uh, 10 day program. And I tried to sit down and reassure, reassure her that, you know, that's just because we provide a lot of delicious foods and uh, we're, as a staff, not disappointed if you gain weight. We just know you like the food. Uh, we also know that nobody's going to serve you uh, ten uh, or five to ten course meals three times a day for ten days. Uh, they're just not going to do that when they get home. They're going to eat a couple of favorite dishes. So I believe it's been five months. She reports about a 50-pound weight loss. And this is a typical story is that, uh, you know, people want to lose uh, 85 pounds and get all the cholesterol out of their body and, you know, feel like they were 17 years old. And they want that to be accomplished in those 10 days. After all, they took all the trouble to travel and see us and to spend all that money to be with us. But why am I not getting instantaneous results? Well, of course, any mature person really understands that it took you more than seven to 10 days to get into trouble. And so, you know, it's going to take you a while to get out of trouble. Just like I got an email this morning from a lady uh, from a foreign country who has rheumatoid arthritis and she's been on the diet for uh, off and on for 10 days. And she doesn't understand why it doesn't work. I said, first of all, it has to be followed strictly. And second of all, sometimes it takes more than 10 days to restore your health, you know, you should give it four months of very strict adherence. And uh, you know, it's a message I have to get. It's very disappointing to, to tell you when Dr. Lim and I sit in with uh, patients at the last visit, and sometimes they're in tears. Sometimes they're in tears the first visit uh, because they did everything Dr. McDougall said, and they didn't get the results. And then at the uh, last visit, most people have accomplished a few pounds of weight loss, maybe maybe three, maybe five, sometimes eight, but sometimes none. They've accomplished no weight loss, and or the, on rare occasions, they may have gained a pound or two. That could be related to uh, menstrual periods. You know, when a woman goes through her menstrual period, she uh, commonly, typically gains weight, water weight. It could be because they just love the food and they get to eat as much as they want. We give them permission. In fact, I insist they eat as much as they want because that's what they're going to do <clears throat> when they go home. And then the third thing that happens is our resort is in a shopping center and IHOP is about 300 feet away. And uh, Starbucks is about another 100 feet from then. And even though we tell them, you know, you can have black coffee or coffee with a tiny bit of soy milk in it, you're not supposed to go over to Starbucks and get your favorite coffee with 600 calories of dairy in it. And some do. <clears throat> and um, I would guess probably even a few. I can't understand why they would after spending all that effort. Some do bring a, a cooler full of food. I guess they're just checking out whether or not our stuff is okay and whether or not they can do it and they don't want to starve to death. But anyway, uh, we're just getting phenomenal results. And, and I know, uh, or at least it hears, I hear through my ears 
that we're getting far better results than we did when we started this maybe 40 years ago versus St. Helena Hospital for 16 years. And then now, well, it wouldn't be 40, it'd be about 32, 33 years. Now for 16 years at the Flamingo Resort, I just can't remember so many good reports. And I think it, it's because of several things. One is the whole climate, the whole understanding worldwide of the importance of diet has changed drastically in the past 10, 20, 30, 40 years. I mean, when I would go to a, a medical conference and I would mention diet and say atherosclerosis or even weight loss or even bad farts or no bowel movements, people would think I was a quack. And uh, that was you know, 50 years ago. And then, and then as time changed, uh, there was more acceptance but not really enthusiastic acceptance. That's never happened except for one or a few doctors. <clears throat> At least there's no denial. At least there's no denial. Uh, Montaigne, 500 years ago, said uh, that a diet has phases of a development. And that is, uh, first people say it's not true, which is where we were 50 years ago. And then uh, nowadays, they say it's true, but not important, meaning it's true. You can cure artery disease, atherosclerosis, and slow and stop cancer, <clears throat> and always cure type 2 diabetes, and drastically improve blood pressure, but more importantly, reduce your risk of stroke and heart attack. It's been proved beyond a doubt, except for a crazy few outliers that have motivations I can't understand. And typically, uh, they follow their advice, just look at their belly. Uh, and then after people accept it as true, but they can't do it, and then they find out people can do it, then the third phase is they say, well, we know it's true, and we know people can do it. And by the way, we discovered it here at Mayo Clinic or at Cleveland Clinic or whatever. We discovered it. 50 years ago, this is not new. We've owned it all along. Anyway, I don't know why I'm going there. <laughs> but we, we're, here, we are here to talk about uh, the last phase of the intestinal tract, which is uh, you know, about 38 feet long from the mouth to the anus. And uh, you know, it's got to be hard to believe for you because it is for me. It's got to be hard for you to believe that when patients go to a doctor with intestinal problems, diarrhea, constipation, irritable bowel syndrome, which, by the way, they've got a new drug that they're selling for hundreds of dollars. Uh, I see it advertised. I, I should have written it down. But, you know, uh, knowing that these are problems of the esophagus and mouth and stomach, and small intestine, and large intestine, and hemorrhoid area, and so on, they uh, never seem to come to the conclusion that diet has anything to do with what you put in your, in, in your intestine. And right? this is just so bizarre that a doctor wouldn't say, well, what are you eating? And know what to do as far as an answer. It's just like somebody who... Uh, went to see a dermatologist with skin problems. The first thing a dermatologist ought to ask is what are you putting on your skin? Contact dermatitis, whether it be from your tennis shoes or lotions, etc. And uh, the first uh, question that a pulmonologist, a lung specialist, ought to be asking somebody who has lung problems is what do you put in your lungs? You know, how close do you live to the highway with all the truck fumes? And, you know, do you smoke 10, 20, 40 cigarettes a day? You would think that's the first thing they would think of. They wouldn't think of uh, maybe he's got a neurologic problem with his skin or she's got a emotional problem making her wheeze. But that's what they come to as far as the conclusion goes. Uh, when it comes to the intestine, couldn't possibly have anything to do with what you put in the intestinal tract. And even when the patient asks, 
I hear this all the time, even when the patient asks about their diet. And I'm talking about gastrointestinal specialists with an extra four years of education after their extra two years of internal medicine training. Even gastroenterologists, without, believe me, but without exception that I can offhand think of. I, I really can't think of a gastroenterologist whose first response, maybe there's one lingering someplace here, to the patient, well, let's talk about your diet first. I always say, uh, listen, lady, I'm the specialist here who went to school for 10 years and who's been into thousands of intestines. Not you, me. So I determine the correct answer, by the way, an alternative truth to why you're sick. Anyway, you hardly stand a chance. So let's, uh, we've, we've been through the intestinal tract. The last uh, few <clears throat> seminars have been dedicated to the things I know about the intestinal tract as a living, eating person and as a practicing doctor who's seen over 10,000 patients is guess what? I'll tell you this forever. And uh, you can get anybody you want to challenge me on any level. A fist fight, a review of the literature, clinical experience, on any level. You can try and get somebody to challenge me to that statement. The health or the sickness of your intestine has to do with what you put in it. <laughs> I don't know. These days, I suppose somebody could make a case for it. Fake news, alternative facts. I've discovered what's going on and why you don't know. Okay, so we're down to the uh, last part of the small intestine. And uh, if you have uh, this book, here it is right here. Uh, you know, my characters, Larry and Louise, and they go through the entire uh, discussion of the intestinal tract. And uh, one of the things that they, I particularly like as a, uh, let's see if I can find as, as a part of this book, remember Howard uh, Gardner, he did all the illustrations in here and just really made it a phenomenal book. But it's a picture, eh, probably, oh, here it is. A picture of Larry and Louise. I, I think it's page 132, 100. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, there you go, Larry and Louise. Those are our characters. And the end, and even though I, I tell the story, uh, uh, they end with... Uh, Geez, Louise, how's the breeze? Something like that. It's in the slides. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it doesn't say it here, but on the slides that I show, geez, Louise, how's the breeze? Uh, well, the breeze has to do with what you put in your intestine as to how it is. If you put dead things, de dead animals, or their secretions, I seem to be out of focus. You are, Dr. McDougall. I don't know. Uh, maybe move uh, around. Maybe move a little bit and see if we uh, will get back there to There I go. Okay. Back. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Amazing what you can do with a little movement. <laughs> I know. Which is part of our discussion. Uh, if you eat dead things, and, and you know, I don't uh, uh, consider plants alive in the sense that they are uh, beans, sentinel beans with feelings, and uh, they're food. Uh, if they are alive in terms of four legs or a few wings or a few flippers, and you eat these things that have died, then the, uh, the whole intestinal tract is affected, including the flatus, which I will refer to as farts. The flatus uh, farts, uh, they, they smell like what you ate. And so people eat the Western diet. Uh, you've, oh, we've all experienced it. You're standing in a room and you go, my God, it smells like something died. And, uh, of course, nobody admits to it. <laughs> uh, all right. It's mainly from the sulfur. Uh, the sulfur that's in the animal products. Uh, turns into hydrogen sulfide and other sulfur compounds that stink, and sulfur stinks, you know, like uh, 
the uh, the mineral pools at uh, Yosemite, the sulfur pit the pools. Uh, that stinks. It's it's hard to be around them for long, or a rotten egg, or uh, all these sulfur compounds is what smells so bad. And I have a list for you as to the sulfur content of uh, animal foods compared to vegetable foods. Like beef has more sulfur, same amount of protein, same amount of calories, four times more sulfur than do beans. And uh, tuna has 12 times more sulfur than does sweet potatoes and so on. There's a whole list of these. And by the way, you can find a lot of this information without owning this book, Digest the Tuna, which, by the way, is still a huge seller after 10 years. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it in still some bookstores, Whole Foods markets, and so on. But you can get essentially all the information, as everything that I do and Mary does. Uh, you can get it on the website. This is in my August 2002 newsletter. It's called Bad Farts Meat Stinks. And uh, so as a result of uh, eating these foods, the animal foods, you get uh, methane gas, you get a large, large amount of sulfur, and it smells bad. Now, there is sulfur, I, I must mention, there is sulfur also in plant foods like onions and garlic. And uh, This sulfur uh, is non-toxic compared to animal sulfur. It still does smell, but the way it's complex with plants makes it not have the cancer-promoting properties, the bowel-irritating properties, uh, the other negative properties that the sulfur in animal foods has. Uh, it certainly does have its odor, but it's a, a distinctly different odor, garlic and onions. Uh, something did not die odor compared to, say, eggs. Eggs are probably the most notorious chicken, beef, and so on. Uh, probably to get the least amount of sulfur would be to eat refined foods, refined uh, wheat, refined rice. Uh, you get the least amount of sulfur. You also get the least amount of other gas-producing uh, substances, which are non-digestible carbohydrates, because in the refining process, you've taken the carbohydrates away the non-digestible carbohydrates away. So you're left with little to make gas. And you're uh, starting out with a low sulfur food like white rice. Now, please, please understand that I'm not make, recommending white rice over brown rice. Uh, this becomes a confusion point for a lot of people. I've made myself absolutely clear that uh, we prefer brown rice, but it ain't a deal breaker. So if you want to minimize the gas the most, you would base your diet on, say, something like white rice with some non-high sulfur vegetables, maybe carrots. and I don't know. I'd have to look at them because uh, the green and yellow vegetables are, uh, especially the green, are, are quite high in sulfur, some of them. And uh, <clears throat> that would give you the minimum amount of gas and the least stinky gas is to do that. Uh, you also have to be very careful about avoiding beans, peas, and lentils. They naturally have at least two sugars in them that you can't digest, or whether you eat uh, bacon and beans or hot dogs and beans or you eat uh, beans and new potatoes like Mary and I had last night. Uh, there, are, there are foods like beans that have a lot of non-digestible carbohydrates. So what do you do with that? I mean, do you, do you like beans? Want to eat beans? Well, you thoroughly cook them. You can start by soaking. Soaking starts the digestive process in the beans. So you can soak them for 12, 24 hours and then cook them. Uh, they'll cook faster if you soak them first because that starts the digestive process. You can make sure they're cooked thoroughly. Uh, uncooked beans are very, very... Uh, high in non-digestible carbohydrates. And as we talked about lectins uh, last week, they're also high in uh, lectins, so high that uh, if you eat things like red beans raw, you get very sick. So you cook your beans, peas, and lentils thoroughly, uh, putting a slice of potato in with it or you know, waving a mag magic wand over the pot. That'll work. So don't even bother trying it. And uh, there's other one other uh, time-honored 
treatment of these legumes that Mary and I have found has always worked. And we have people who won't eat beans unless they do this, which is sprout them first. You lay them on a, a piece of uh, paper towel for, say, 12 hours moist, and they form this little white sprout. And that sprouting process digests those non-digestible carbohydrates. Then after the sprout occurs, say, 12 hours later, then what you do is you cook them, and then you will get degassed beans. Uh, or you don't have to eat beans at all. I mean, beans, peas, and lentils are unnecessary for the protein or any anything else. You get all the protein you eat from rice and corn and potatoes, etc. Now, one last category that I'd be remiss in discussing is what causes the most gas in the most people in the world, and that's milk, milk sugar, lactose. It's in all milk, all mammalian milks, including human milk. Uh, but uh, the the enzyme lactase, which is produced in the mammal infant, uh, starts to disappear around four years of age in humans, uh, and it's essentially gone in about eighty percent of uh, Caucasian white people uh, as they move into adolescence and adulthood. So when they eat lactose, the sugar lactose, they don't have the enzyme lactase to digest it. So it goes to the large intestine where bacteria digest the lactose. Now that's in, say, 20% of white people. Uh, Non-white people, Asians, Inuit Eskimos, Hispanics, Blacks, I mean, as, as many as 90% of the Blacks and, and uh, Asians in the world lose this enzyme after they pass through infancy. And uh, once and, and as a result, they can't digest milk sugar. I had a conversation that dates back many years, and I, sometimes these things come to mind, and some, hopefully they'll all come out okay. I gave a talk at a dietetic conference in Sacramento, California, for UC. I think it was sponsored by UC Davis and the California Dietetic Association. And I gave a talk, boy, it could have been 20 years ago, probably was, to uh, an audience of dietitians and doctors and interested people, large group. And I got up, uh, I got finished, and uh, I answered the usual questions, which were kind and so on. And then one dietitian who worked for the state of California came up to me and said, what you're doing is shameful. You're killing people, giving them osteoporosis by telling them to not drink milk. And uh, essentially, uh, either I felt it or she said it, I'm going to report you to the state (laughs) for your recommendations. I said, well, and there happened to be a black lady and an Asian lady standing in the conversation. And I said to you, to this dietitian, I said, I'm going to report you for racial discrimination to the state. And let's see how that flies, because you are recommending a food that makes people sick. And it's racially biased and discriminatory. I said, this lady right here, uh, black, 90% of her and her relatives can't digest milk. Uh, This lady here, Asian, same thing. So you are condemning these people, you are being racially discriminatory. So you are condemning these people to be sick with diarrhea, gas, and cramps in the hopes that you're going to help the people who can digest it, which are whites. Whites, you know, no racial bias here. And I said, I'm going to report you to the state for your racial bias and your practice as a dietitian working for California. Wow, did that stop the conversation? <laughs> anyway, I, I didn't do it, but I would. Uh, if, if I ran into a dietitian in California and I had uh, some access to the uh, department that deals with racial equality, I'd report him or her as practicing their profession 
in a racially biased manner, condemning people who can't digest lactose to sickness. When obviously, if digesting lactose or drinking dairy products after your weaning time, which is about two to four years of age, <clears throat> has obviously not been necessary for blacks and Asians who have uh, been on this planet for, I don't know, however long you want to date homo sapiens or humanoids, it, at least 250,000 years. Or maybe you could uh, make your argument back several million years. So um, anyway, the gas thing. Uh, eat a simple diet. Thoroughly cook your food, particularly beans, peas, and lentils. Uh, if the uh, odor of onions and garlic disturb you, and by the way, it only disturbs you if uh, <clears throat> you don't happen to eat onions gar and garlic. Uh, cultures, families that eat a lot of garlic. I mean, it's normal and natural. And uh, well, let me take a minute to go into that. There is a, a neuroadaptive process that takes place in our senses, our, our vision, our hearing, our smell. Uh, these senses uh, adapt to familiar things, and they do it for survival reasons. Uh, you want to be aware of new and threatening things. Uh, senses that have been proved to you by time to not be threatening, you can tune out, you can ignore. For example, if uh, there's a lawnmower outside, and we're talking, you may initially hear that lawnmower, but after a few minutes, uh, the sound disappears to your, from your consciousness. Uh, if you go into a dark room, it is initially quite dark, but soon you have a neural adaption in your sight so that you can see better quite well in a dark room. Or if you go into a light room, the same thing happens. It's way too bright, and then you adapt. Uh, same goes for smell. If you go into a new environment, say somebody meets somebody from a new culture who uh, happens to like garlic, and they never notice it, that whatever family or culture that is, because that's part of the routine. They have adapted to that as something normal and culturally safe, so that something new, new, say in terms of sound or in terms of sight, can be quickly distinguished from things that have been proved by your body to be non-threatening because, you know, they've been around and, you, and it hasn't hurt you and it hasn't caused you to, to flee. And so it does with smell. Uh, you can notice it in other people, cultural groups. But probably something you can all relate to is if you go into someone's home, the first time you go into their home, no matter how clean it is, or a new building, no matter how crystal clean it is, there are smells that you detect immediately. You smell the Christmas tree, or the cooking turkey, or, you know, it could be anything. And uh, the first time, and then after you were there for a while, it disappears from your consciousness, as it should, because you want to be aware of possibly dangerous odors coming in. And then the next time you go back to the person's house, uh, it's a little less abrupt because you've already become familiar with it. And then eventually it becomes just like your own home. You walk in, you can't notice it. So when people say, to end this discussion, that their farts don't stink, which they do. I mean, they do say that. And they do. It's uh, only because they have uh, neuroadapted to them. Okay, that's it. <laughs> okay, that was enough. <laughs> that's all you need to know about farts. <laughs> I did in my August 2002 newsletter, a whole discussion, and other ways to deal with them, like to take activated charcoal, uh, and a few other suggestions for you. But if you're just starting the diet, wait a couple of weeks. Your bowel bacteria will change. You'll always have uh, excess gas from beans, peas, and lentils. It's just that it won't smell like something died. Right, right. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Dario. That was very enlightening. <laughs> and uh, More than you wanted to know, but at least, more than gives we you, to know. at least you give you, you information to take action. And you can ask your close friends, do my farts smell? 
<laughs> and, if and if they're really good friends, they'll uh, yeah. at least write it down on paper for you. Right. Or send you a note. <laughs> oh. I always remember my first visit at the 10 day program you did. That was the first time that I heard a doctor talk about this kind of thing. And it's, it's you know, you, you're very thankful that, that's, that it's talked about and it's not a mystery. So. Well, it, it should be something. Well, first of all, the problem is, is the medical and dietetic business have no idea. And I'm talking in general, but I'm probably hitting 99% of them. They have no idea. Well, maybe not dietitians. They don't know what to put the right thing in the intestine. But they have no idea that what you eat and put in your intestinal tract has any relevance to health. Mm -hmm. If they did, you wouldn't find these dietitians and physicians recommending the paleo diet, 55% dead animals, or right. the low-carb diets, which are mostly dead animals. They wouldn't do it into something so stupid. Right. They just don't know. They're ignorant and they refuse to get educated, which brings me to universal health care. When we pass universal health care, and more and more people are talking about it, I hope I'm well enough and forceful enough that they will hire me as a uh, prime advisor. I mean, if we could just get out there uh, and we had a system that would uh, would rule over the pharmaceutical industries and the mm -hmm. hospitals and the insurance companies, well, uh, a system to protect the consumer. If we would just, we didn't have to tell them not to sell these things in the store, but if we just had disclaimers, like on a beef package, uh, Surgeon General's warning, this food will pollute your oceans, liver, uh, rivers and, uh, and, and streams. And uh, cheese, we put Surgeon General's warning. The, this food will give you a heart attack and a stroke. You know, like Surgeon General's warning, smoking will kill you. Mm -hmm. uh, if we could just put that out there and with great enthusiasm, like we did in the past with cigarettes, I don't see much right. discouragement these days from uh, people smoking. I, I Maybe I'm just missing that, but... That's kind of been set aside as dealt with. It's not dealt with. Right. Uh, but if, you know, yeah, morning cartoons told the kids their foods, potatoes, you know, uh, steak means a dead cow and a dead planet. Uh, we can make a big difference. Or we, we had uh, <clears throat> messages uh, say when you walked into a doctor's office, we had to have a disclaimer that the doctor had to pass, pass out to the patient, say a general practice. Disclaimer, diabetic treatment has been shown to kill people for type two diabetes. Aggressive treatment kills, and these particular drugs that claim a reduction in heart disease are dangerous, criminally expensive, and do more harm than good. And of course, at the bottom of that disclaimer, we should say something like, and your diet will fix these problems but just something as simple as that, just like they made, right. yeah, made a surgeon general warning on tobacco. And I'll put a warning on uh, your, your cheese, on your uh, your pork chops, and you know, because they're killing more people than tobacco ever did, more people than alcohol does. Uh, we're talking about eighty percent of the population being overweight, thirty-eight percent being obese, half dying of diet-related atherosclerosis. One in seven getting breast cancer, at least. Mm -hmm. One in seven getting prostate cancer, type 2 diabetes, and, well, maybe it's 15% of the population now. It seems to keep growing and half pre-diabetic. We're talking about serving people in this country foods that are known to sicken and kill and doing nothing about it. Food poisoning, like you say in your book. Uh, why doesn't somebody listen? It's just like we have so many eye-opening moments these days in our political system and worldwide situation. You know, uh, people are talking about universal health care, which I'm not going to make a campaign line. So, uh -huh. but uh, but I think it's uh, I think it's uh, well, I think the current system is unfair. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so well, you have some good. questions here. We so do. We probably, have. 
questions for you. So someone is asking Dr. McDougall um, if you have found that uh, women have more trouble than men with uh, gas, and if so, if you think it's something due to stress or hormones. You know, in this <laughs> book, in this book, uh, in chapter 13, it discusses that. Uh, it discusses, uh, 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 there is a group, by the way, that I tried to work with, <clears throat> and uh, the, the reference is someplace in this book. I believe they're from outside Chicago, who uh, studied farts. They study farts. That's what they do, study farts. They take a plastic bag and tape it around your anus, and they collect your farts. And then they, collect, they, they find out the volume of farts every day, and uh, then they also put it to the sniff test, which I can hardly believe. You can only do it with testers being human beings. There's no machine that does this. So uh, <laughs> they collect the farts in this bag. Now, as far as I know, they're still doing this. It's still active research. Uh, they collect uh, the gas in the bag, and then they have a panel sniff it. And they rate it as to, you know, offensiveness. And uh, it, it talks about it in the book. So you can look it up, and it gives you the reference. It says that women's farts stink worse. I don't know why. I'm not going to get into that discussion. <laughs> no <Today>. way! <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, I asked that group. See, we did a study at our clinic around 2004. And the study was uh, uh, with our dentist who had a hell meter, which is a uh, meter that lots of dentist office have. It measures the amount of sulfur in your breath because sulfur is what stinks. And so we did uh, tests seven days apart on the amount of sulfur in their breath. And we found, on average, the sulfur was cut in half the halitosis was cut in half in one week. So I, I got in contact with this group, and we went quite far in our discussion as far as uh, doing a study. I think the only thing that was lacking is I didn't have my foundation then. I think if I had my foundation, which you're all encouraged to contribute to because we're doing active research, the money pays for students to come to the program and learn. I, I didn't have the foundation, and I think if I would have, I could have put enough money into it to have them do it. What I wanted them to do, and again, they publish actively in medical journals about the smell and characteristic of farts. So I was asking them to at least do something more uh, sociably acceptable, and that was to check the sulfur out of somebody's mouth. And we, we got quite a ways, and I don't know why. I, I sent the proposal and the research and our data to them, but they eventually said, it was a long process, so I know they seriously considered it. They eventually said no. But what a study. I, I would open this to any scientific community uh, with the uh, resources to come to our program. Like we just had 53 people a few days ago. And uh, check their breath with a HAL meter or whatever else is sophisticated uh, for the amount of sulfur when they begin and check it at the end. Don't you think this would be important? Uh, this would be as important and more important than the cause of breast cancer or uh, mm -hmm. the cause of a heart attack. But people are working day and night to improve their attractiveness and spending thousands of dollars to somehow make themselves look better. They spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to surround themselves with cars, automobiles that would detract from their personal appearance and make them look better. They spend tens of thousands of dollars a year on a wardrobe and stick a fat, sickly, greasy body in it, thinking that's the way they'll look better. They spend hundreds of dollars, if not thousands, on perfumes mm -hmm. and deodorants to look better, just to cover up the unsightliness that is, could be fixed oh, almost overnight. It would begin overnight by changing a major, the major cause of their unattractiveness. Food. Right. Yeah, food. Yeah. It just it just makes no common sense except for the fact that you don't make money by selling potatoes. You do make money by selling Teslas. That's right. That's so. right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> That's very true. So I have another question for you. Uh, I have been 
on the on a vegan diet for two months and still have terrible trouble with gas at night, which really disrupts my sleep. I cut out beans from my diet last night and slept much better. Uh, if I cut out beans and still eat a variety of plant foods, will I get enough protein? Well, you, I think you answered. I've already answered that. Yeah. It, it, protein deficiency is impossible on a starch-based diet, uh, whole food pro process. Pro whole food starch-based diet, pure vegan. It is impossible. It has never been reported except for by the dairy industry which you and the meat industry, which use that argument for unique positioning to mm -hmm. sell their products. They, right. It's basically a absolute lie that anybody can prove who takes the trouble to find a case of protein deficiency without starvation. Now, you can become protein deficient if you eat nothing. But then you're vitamin C deficient, you're fiber deficient, you're calorie deficient, you're calcium, you're everything deficient. But if you eat a sufficient amount of calories of whole food, you can never, never develop protein or calcium deficiency or omega-3 fatty acid deficiencies, which are the three pillars upon which unique positioning is established for the meat, dairy, and fish industry. Right. Something unique. Even though it's not true, we it's have enough. more calcium than any other food. Well, we also have more lactose, which is going to make you fart and stink bad. Uh, we have more protein than any other food. Yes. Well, we also have more saturated fat than any other food. And we'll get you to drop dead a few years earlier from a heart attack or stroke. Right. You know, they don't advertise the negative things, they want to put their product in a unique situation. Yeah. Yeah, like you said many liar, times. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Right. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm much more basic in it again. Liar, liar, <laughs> pants on fire. You can't get any it's more clear. That's what you need to tell the dairy and the meat and the fish industry. Liar, liar. <laughs> That's right. Well, they're doing a good job. That's what we can say for sure. Uh, they're prosperous industries. Yes. They're doing a great job in terms of destroying the planet, killing cows, making animals suffer, and rapidly, in an epidemic style, sickening and killing mm -hmm. husbands, wives, fathers and mothers, and children. Right. Now, it's okay. I think it's okay, and I've said this before. I think it's okay if you kill yourself if you're over 21. You know, if you're over 21, you know all the things about meat and dairy and the truth about diet. Hey, have a good time. Eat yourself to look like a king or a queen. But when you're under 21, you're a child. And uh, we have an obligation to protect our children from tobacco and alcohol and sickening, deadly foods. I wasn't protected, as you know. And at 18, I had a massive stroke, which I've lived with for almost 53 years. Uh, that was child abuse. This is child abuse going on, and boy, do we need a revolution. And you Along know, with the other revolutions that are going on, and I'm not going to talk about them, <laughs> a lot of the other revolutions that are going on, you know, we, gotta, we need to really stomp out the, the, the food-killing businesses. You know, the, on the other end of this uh, range here, the uh, you mentioned children, and but there's also senior abuse because I oh. see all this... Uh, places, nursing homes, where they're truly killing each and every one of them um, with the food that they're serving them. They're, it's just, and, and they're helpless. They're there. And... Uh, uh, See, now that, that to me makes no financial sense. It makes and no financial sense. I know. Yeah. You've got, you're trying to collect this herd of people. That's These right. These old, old uh, uh, end of life people, you know, don't take anything I say as being negative, but you're trying, you want these clients. You want them in your beds. You want them taking well, advantage of your possible. medical care for as long as possible. Why kill them? You know, right. if they're going right. to die in two years with the uh, nursing care home, assisted uh, living care home diet they're feeding, and they're going to live in two years, what if you got them to live five years? There's got to be some competition out there. I think that, that this is a, a, a future business for someone out there that yeah. wants to do this because I don't, I, that light bulb hasn't gone off in these places. They need to feed them the McDougal diet.
because of course it's going to be good for the patients but they're going to keep this uh clients there for a longer time <clears throat> this anyway. this has been this this conclusion has come uh to many many people i've been yeah. asked this many times and one of the more uh interesting things uh, again i have to refer to the fact that i've been doing this for 40 years and in, me in medicine for half a century but about probably 30 years ago or so there's this uh, wealthy investor in hawaii who had the idea, uh, he had the property, and he had the idea of building a community, a retired uh, mm -hmm. assisted living community, just like mm -hmm. there are thousands of them, tens, probably tens of thousands of them all over the country, where yeah. people go uh, for different uh, levels of care. You know, they start out with a home, right. and they go with uh, into an area of more assistance, and finally they, they are taken care of at the end of life. Exactly. And uh, their suggestion to me, in fact, we he even flew me in his airplane from Honolulu over to the Big Island to see the property. Uh, his suggestion was, let's build this kind of community. And uh, there will be uh, many takers who want to stay alive and get the right food. Uh, so it's been talked about. It's been somewhat seriously talked about. But nobody has had the vision to date to make the move to do something that's so obvious, so uh, uh, you know, to me, and I've been fooled many times, but to me, it would be an overnight sold out business. Uh, uh -huh. People who heard about this, uh, I'd yeah. sign up. I'd put my $10,000 down for sure. a deposit. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Well, there's gotta be millions of people in the US and oh, sure. Canada. Oh, yeah. uh, Europe and just be, I know this for sure because people love to come to our weekends and our events just to be around people who think sanely yes. in terms right. of medical care. You know, to be able to go to a facility where the doctors all understood that uh, one of the greatest hazards to elderly people is the medications they're on. Mm -hmm. And on mm -hmm. average, uh, let me just throw out a figure I remember, which could be incorrect, but the average. Uh, Elderly person, we're probably talking about 65 and older, is on 12 medications. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, these medications all have horrible side effects, few benefits, and certainly few benefits where they wouldn't be rather uh, better taken care of with a good diet. And uh, it would be a haven for us to be able to go to someplace safe mm -hmm. where uh, we're not worried about our doctors hurting and killing us. And where we know we can uh, walk to the dining room or have foods delivered to our uh, private residents that are not only health promoting, but constipation relieving. Right. right. And longevity preserving. And also had a whole bunch of other people in your neighborhood or your, on the floor of your assisted living care who all spoke the same language right. and the same enthusiasm. Look forward to the same healthy starch based meals. Yeah, this is a thought that's been ignored, as far as I know. Maybe somebody's out there. Yeah. Doing it. Yeah. Well, uh, the key person in these places, Dr. Maduro, in an assisted living place, a nursing home, I think even maybe more important that the doctor is the the chef or the chefs, because they're actually, I know a place here where I live where uh, it's truly this chef is just killing people. I mean, they're putting tons and tons of oil and lard on the are completely unnecessary and um, so i think we need the chefs to be trained and to be you available know, gustavo we could train him overnight it just give them right little, yeah. just give them a little money and well aj them. would be glad right. to do it <laughs> yeah, she, she would love to do it too but the, uh, the reason the chefs act the way they do yeah and I know a lot of chefs. I know chefs that are oh. own and run vegan restaurants. Yeah. They don't believe that they can make food that tastes good without drowning it in oil. Right. They just plant it. And I, and I can understand, you know, when I was a, uh, a heavy meat eater back probably before, before I was uh, 25 years old, mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine somebody living without uh, slices of beef and globs of cheese. Yeah. Yeah, it would be. It's, it was unconceivable. Unconceivable. Yes. Yeah, and I understand why the chefs feel that they do. And by the way, you look at chefs. Now, my mm. impression is 
they're not going to win the biggest loser contest. No. There are a lot of uh, chefs that were 46 plus size inch belts mm -hmm. and have double chins hanging on their chest. Mm -hmm. So they have to know. They don't know. They just no. don't know. The administrators think that if they didn't serve, uh, you know, meat and other things that people have lived on all their life, they've got a business. There's just so much misinformation. Mm, so much misinformation. At least I think so, but I could be wrong. I mean, I've, I, I, I started up uh, two food companies. Uh, one did, still yeah. alive. You yeah. know, one still alive in over 6,000, or over 8,000 stores mm -hmm. called Dr. Mm -hmm. McDougall's Right Foods. The other one I lost everything except my house on. Uh, but, you know, you have to start someplace and take some yeah. risks. Yeah. But the second food company, which I don't own anymore, but uh, re represents Mary and I well, Dr. McDougall's Right Foods yeah, has yes, yes. all kinds of soups and cereals and really, really good tasting food. Oh, it is, yes. It, it's not Dr. McDougall's perfect food. Right. It's Dr. McDougall's Right Food. So you might say, well, this has salt in it. Well, right, no yeah. salt, no sale. Right. This has sugar in it. No sugar, no sale. You know, we're not going to go out of business. We started this company in 1993, and uh, we have been a huge seller in stores all over the country. Uh, as I say, we're in over 6,000 mm -hmm. stores. Yeah, with, yeah I, I believe see it all about the time. maybe when we have, I don't know, maybe 35 SKUs, in yeah. other words, different things like. Uh, Ramen miso soup and exactly and oatmeal uh, for breakfast and tortilla soup has mm -hmm. been on, on on our list for all those years since oh, and black bean soup is um, is wonderful yeah and uh, so well, anyway. and this and these are foods that I think be it, I mean it's I don't think you meant it for people to have and to eat every single day I use them when I travel uh, outside of the country. And I want to yeah. take it for emergencies, or if I ran out of food at home and I have something there. But uh, like you said, it's not McDougall's perfect food, but it's much better than any other choice out there. Yeah, our, ours has like 400 milligrams of sodium. <coughs> the leading ramen has 1,400 milligrams uh -huh. of sodium. Right. right. Uh, so yeah, well, as far as eating it every day, Gustavo, I have to admit <laughs> that as time goes on. Uh, and uh, I get more home oriented. Yes. I find myself eating them almost every day. <laughs> right, right. Uh, ra rather than being someplace else. And they are uh, not only convenient, but delicious. Oh, yeah. And yeah. take care of at least one meal for me. Right. But not every day. Maybe I eat them five times a week or four times a week. Right. Uh, you know, rather than eating pork chops. Well, and, uh, yes. Uh, Bacon wrapped hot dogs. Mm -hmm. Yes, you should eat them every day. You should, yes. Dr. McDougall, is there um, a difference? Between, someone is asking, what about burping? Is burping caused by the same as farting, or is it like a completely different? Uh... Well, I, 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 I may be giving you an inaccurate answer on this. Okay. Uh, but, the, but the best that I can recall, uh, burping is due to irritation of the lower esophagus and upper stomach. And uh, as a result, people burp. But no, I, I don't believe the gas goes that far up. I believe the gas doesn't start until you hit the fermenting department, which is the large intestine. The large intestine has four trillion bacteria per cc, per milliliter, four trillion. And it has well over 400 different species of bacteria but prior to the cecum, which is the beginning of the large intestine, the small intestine is not totally sterile, but it's almost sterile. And that uh, being sterile, in other words, without bacteria, begins in the stomach. And the stomach acid is part of that. And digestive enzymes are part of that. So uh, to get the gas all the way from the large intestine back up to the stomach to be... Uh, to be uh, burped out, that'd be a 20-foot journey. And, and I don't think that happens. I think it's more from irritation of the stomach, and there are so many things that irritate the stomach on the Western diet. And then again, there are other things, uh, I, I think, right. due to burping, because all of a sudden it just kind of happens, doesn't it? 
would it would it be something that maybe we are swallowing up, swallowing air? Is oh yeah, yeah, that would be very good, and that could contribute to farts too, swallowing air. Uh, you know, because that just is all going down. You know, the whole thirty-eight feet. Right. <clears throat> so um, yeah, swallowing air has to do a lot with the gas in the intestinal tract, but I couldn't give you. Uh, let's see. Is there anything I mean, can't like? If I say beans, you say farts. If I say burping, is there a particular food that comes to mind? Maybe irritating foods. I don't. I don't know. I mean, not, nothing really comes to mind exactly. Right. For me. They just. They just kind of, kind of, kind of come out of nowhere. And uh, right, right. I think that I've eating heard, fast makes it. Sometimes fast. I know this. Yeah. yeah but. Okay. Well, maybe somebody could shed some so, light on that for us. Someone here, Stephanie, wants me to say this. I say, can you please say to Dr. McDougall, thank you in big words uh, for your hard work. I came across your work six months ago, and I now I have my high blood pressure under control with this start solution diet. Great. Okay. Thank you. I, I, you know, people come up to me all the time, and you've heard this before, and I'm going to tell it to you as long as I can stand. People come up to me and say, you know, at conferences or uh, other places, they say, I, I bet you're tired of hearing this. And my response is, no, not, no, not. Tell me. I want to hear it. Because uh, that's what makes <laughs> all no, of us feel get good. Tired. Right. All of us feel good because we've helped other people. And all our staff feels the same way. We love, and so do you, whatever you do. You know, I love the flowers you sent me. I love the bridge you built me. I love that you built me the, the highest skyscraper in the city. You know, I love that you gave me a great massage. We all want to hear that we helped others. So I never get tired of hearing it. And where I'd like you to put it, which I read all the time, is on our discussion board under testimonies. You know, yes. I read those every day, and there are too few of you. I know it's work because you've got to sign up for the discussion board. Uh, but there's so many of you that have uh, contributions to make to encourage other people. I, I think for people who are interested beginning in this, for them to hear that it worked for someone else is more compelling than to hear there's 50 scientific papers that say it works. Oh, because you, yeah. you, read, you read about somebody else and they say, well, I, I lost 50 pounds or my indigestion went away or my rheumatoid arthritis went away, et cetera. And you say to yourself, wow, that worked for them. And if they can do it, I can do it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. please go to the testimony section on the discussion board. If you, uh, I know you appreciate what Mary and I and Gustavo and the rest of the staff have done for you. Uh, payback. It's time for payback as much as you can. Yes. Go to tell, the every, board. tell everybody you know, go to the discussion board. And somebody should seriously consider writing your story up as a Star McDougaller. We probably have 150, 200 Star McDougallers in there uh -huh. talking about their story, their difficulty in transition, their results. And these are real learning experiences. Yes. They can do it. I can do it. <laughs> and I know that people, there are a lot of people that have asked and continue to ask about Jeff Novick being in a webinar. Well, at least he is in the discussion board as far as I no, he, he answers questions. So yeah. Yeah. we will have a question for Jeff Novick, who is an amazing dietitian. I, I would I would not uh, uh, put myself in a position to defend uh, Jeff Novick's decisions on how he appears uh, and presents his information. He does a phenomenal job for yes. us. Yes, but he, yes. But he, uh, he, he's uh, pretty much limited his presentations to one-on-one. -on -one. So if you uh -huh. want to spend time with Jeff, you must come to any of our programs mm -hmm. that we have scheduled now, which are the intensive weekend, which is in September, the least expensive, most potent contact you'll have with the staff of the McDougal program. We're all there. We're all available. We're all excited to hear you. And we're going to feed you the entire weekend our favorite foods. And we also make available for you to get lab tests if you'd like. Right. So the intensive weekend, and there's one in September, there'll probably be one in February of uh, 2018, uh, is, uh, like I say, just 
you know, I, it's a good thing I don't check the books to see whether or not I'm losing money. But it's one of the <laughs> least least expensive uh, th- contacts that we can really have. Is, Dr. Magdalena, it's very affordable. Like, um, and, think- and uh, yeah, that, that's, that's, you know, that's the short answer. Or for people who've been through the 10-day program, and they want to get together with a group again. That's a real good yeah, way to, to get way. you back on track. And those of you who can't just, just can't afford the time or the money, uh, those we, that weekend is a good one. We'll do probably yeah. two a year from now on. But, folks, there's nothing like the 10-day program. And I say that from my point of view as a doctor, uh, this is not a one-night stand. No, we really get to know you. Yeah. And really get to address your serious problems. And uh, Dr. Lim and I get to be your doctor for an entire week. And we make it make advice to you, recommendations that you'll get no place else. You'll find yeah. no place I know of. No. There probably, there probably are two, a couple. But there's no place I really know of that actively works to get you off all unnecessary medications. The 10 day program is really. The only practical place I know on planet Earth to come and under expert, board certified, doctor supervision, interested all in your health, not uh, proving anything by how much medicine you can get you off of, will take you off all unnecessary medication. And our published research shows that we get nearly 90% of people, mm-hmm. let me say it again, nine zero, ninety percent 90% of people yeah. uh, to reduce or get off all their type 2 diabetic medication, blood pressure medication, and most other medications they're able to get off of. Uh, so it's an opportunity I don't think you're going to find anyplace else. We invite you. I think August is uh, almost sold out. It's probably, probably if it's not sold out, it'll be sold out this week. Oh, yeah. And then the next one we do the pub for the public is not until December. Mm-hmm. And we do uh, once for companies in the fall, which, again, I put a plea out to you. Uh, help us. We want to get involved in more companies mm-hmm. to make them money by reducing their self-insured health care costs, or even if they're insured by a second party, they, their costs depend upon the health of their employees. Right. Uh, to help them have more e- efficient, functional, and I would argue intelligent, because <laughs> those people who accept this way of eating have to be more intelligent than the general crowd. Mm-hmm. Last yeah. Uh, employees and uh, please, please get involved with us. Uh, we've been involved with Whole Foods for probably six years with CenturyLink. It'll be our third year. These companies keep coming back for a reason. They can see the balance sheet and they can see where they're saving money. Even if it was only 1%. But it's more. It's a lot more. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. When, we did, when we did a study with Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, back in the early 2000s, we cut their health care costs for the company, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota. We cut their health care costs on average for the year, three years in a row, by 44% mm-hmm. based on their claims data. I mean, to me, it just seems it's... you know senseless to spend your money on uh, more tests that bring people into the business that are useless and killing their patient, their employees. Uh, it, it's just senseless. And not yes. to have a program act- activity that gives you better employees. These people are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars and some of them millions of dollars to reach Sure, sure. Oh, yeah. So send, send them to us. We, we will take expert care of them. We are experts, professionals. And taking care of 120, 140 and more people. Uh, or we take care of 50 people, uh, depending right. on the situation. So, you know, if you have a company, go talk to the person who writes the checks, not the HR people. <laughs> you know, they just want to do everything right to keep their job. But the man or woman sitting at the desk where the checks are written and they can see the profits and losses. And they go, my goodness. This healthcare thing is killing us, and there's no way to get a hold of it. Uh, you're wrong. There is there's a way right. to get a hold of it. And, I, and if I had my way about it, and someday I'll spend the whole hour telling you what I would do, <laughs> that'll be a, 
a, a blistering hour, let me tell you. <clears throat> I might even get excited. But then, you never know. I'm usually a calm person, so probably not. Well, Dr. McDougall, I lost a little bit of the sound, but I think it's from, from my end, you know, but I, I um, so I don't know. Well, uh, hopefully, if, hopefully if, people okay. heard that we, we, we should feel welcome with us. Okay. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, we're the I right place. You. Yeah, we're the right place. Well, thank you for another wonderful webinar. And um, people are very appreciative. They're all right in here. Yeah. And uh, well, folks, just remember. Just remember, just because you can't smell it, it doesn't mean the person next to you can't. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's how I like to leave the presentation. <clears throat> but it's not yeah. just when you walk, you talk, like in our program. When you walk and talk, you also stink. And it's because of the dead things you yeah. in your intestine. Can I be more clear? No, I think that you are 100% clear. Well, uh, so next week we're going to do chapter fourteen, I think. I still, think chapter fourteen about, about evolution. It's evolution, anatomy, and proper human nutrition. Yeah, you know, that might be okay. I don't think we've talked about that. I think, I think and, that's and, interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, well, it'd be fun to talk about. Uh, everybody knows that we're not designed to eat the meats and drink. Uh, I think that would be uh, secretions as well. No, we, we, let's go over that and maybe. Uh, <clears throat> Maybe we'll get on another subject line. I know you'd like to talk about the women's book. And uh, I might be, uh, you know, I, except for the fact that I think the women's book should be repackaged and sold. It's such an amazing book. Uh, I have considered putting it up on the website for free. I own it. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. I don't know. I probably won't. Like I did put uh, the a challenging second opinion. I think it's in my October 2015 or 16 newsletter, maybe 2016. Yeah, October 2016. I put that chapter on breast cancer up for free, and we went through all the chapters, didn't we, in that book, and gave it to people for free. Tell us the name of the what? Um, uh, it, what is it's, the uh, title it's of the book? This if you look back at the last year's webinars, remember you and I went for a whole year. Right, right, exactly. And we, and we, put, we put every exactly. single chapter up from this book, which, by the way, some some people say it's the best book I've ever written. And I have to yes, say it. wonderful. Can people still find these chapters on the website? I believe so. Yeah, huh? I think they're still there. We can, uh, I can, I can look it up. And yeah, maybe you can remember what you tell. And I can put yeah. the women's book, and I can put the heart book up. But I, I really okay. think they need to be republished. And yeah, everything you need to know medically is in here. I wrote it 35 years ago, and almost nothing's changed. Yeah, you could get a 30-second update from your physician as to what's changed from the chapter on breast cancer and other cancers and heart disease. And right. Only 30 seconds it would take your specialist to update those chapters. And it would all be positive. It would yeah. all be, yep, he was right. He was right. He was right. Oh, nothing's changed. We made uh, no significant improvement except for the price. We have changed the price. It now costs 20 <laughs> times more for the same treatment. That's right. That's right. Uh, well, no, 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 it, it's fun. We're all retired. It's wonderful to be with you. Thank you again. And, um, uh, I will, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you next week, Dr. McDougall. Yeah, next week will be good. Think about September now. We're, uh, we've got this yeah. great intensive weekend going. I know. And we have just a, a couple of spots for August left, and then December's the next time. So we'd love yeah. to see you. Uh, you know, time spent without good health is time wasted. And uh, it's as simple That's as right. getting okay. a ticket out here to Santa Rosa. And I know it's not it. Cheap. And that's one of the reasons I, we give everywhere yeah. everything away free. You know, it's just that uh, when we put together a, a team like we do for these weekends and ten days, uh, it's not cheap. <laughs> you know, it's we put everything. Well, it pays for itself very quickly, and I can yeah. attest to that. Um, Dr. McDougall, one of the things that they, you teach us in, in most of your events, if not all of them, is how to rearrange your environment because the environment is so important when we change 
our way of eating. And so I want to mention that because, well, because that's what you do. And also on Monday, I'm doing a free webinar with Dr. Doug Lyle and Chef AJ, okay. and it's only about change. It's called Mastering the Environment, and it's free. I want to invite how, everybody to. How do they find How do they find out about it? I forget the link, but what I'm going to do, oh, I'm just going to put oh, it on the. That's terrible, Gustavo. Doing all this work, and now I only have 58 different webinars running, so it's like. <laughs> well, you should you yeah. should uh, put a uh, subsection on the website called Gustavo Speaks Out. I, that's right. Yes, Gustavo is getting old, so he's forgetting. Oh, and, but, but it will eventually be on web, CFH's website, I guess. But I'll let everybody know. I'm this sure will people will appreciate way. it. And get to get yes. you and AJ and Doug Lyle together will be a psychological experience. Yes. The three of you together should be <laughs> something people never forget. It could be dangerous. Yes. All right. Well, could, could be disturbing. So be prepared, prepared at all. All right. My pleasure. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, Goodbye Dr. Wayne Okay.